Chapter Seventeen of Agincourt, a Romance by George Payne Rainsford James. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Preparation. It was late in the evening of the same day of which we have just been speaking when Ella Brune returned to her hostelry. She had gone back to thank fair Mary Markham for her kindness, intending only to stay for a few moments but her new friend detained her till the sun was near his setting, and then only let her depart under the escort of Hugh of Clatford and another yeoman, after extracting a promise from her that she would return on the following morning, after the sad ceremony of her grandsire's funeral was over. And now Ella sat in her lonely little chamber, with the tears filling her bright eyes, which seemed fixed upon a spot of sunshine on the opposite wall of the court, but, in reality, saw nothing, or at least conveyed no impression to the mind. Why was it Ella wept? To say truth, Ella herself could not, or would not, tell. It was perhaps the crowding upon her of many sad sensations, the torrent swelled by many smaller rills, which caused those tears. And yet there was one predominant feeling, one that she wished not to acknowledge even to her own heart what can i call it how shall i explain it it was not disappointment for as i have said before she did not she had never hoped no the best term for it is love without hope and oh what a bitter thing that is during the whole of that morning she had had no time to dwell upon it she had been occupied while she remained with mary markham in struggling against her own sensations not examining them but now she paused and pondered in solitude and in silence she gave way to bitter thought but it was not with the weak and wavering with irresolution of a feeble mind on the contrary though the anguish would have its tear she regarded her present fate and future conduct with the firm and energetic purposes of a heart inured to suffer and to decide her mind rested upon richard of woodville upon his kindness his generosity his chivalrous protection of her who had never met with such protection before and the first strong determination of her mind expressed itself in the words she murmured to herself i will repay it then again she asked herself why should i feel shame or fear or hesitation now at the thought of following him through the world of watching for the hour for the moment when god may grant me the grace to serve him he loves another and is loved by another he can never be anything to me but the friend who stood forward to help me in the hour of need what has sex or station to do with it why should i care more than if i were a man and how often do the meanest by watchful love find an opportunity to deliver or to support the highest and the mightiest why should i think of what men may say or believe true in my own heart and conscious of my truth i may well laugh at suspicion which follows such as i am whatever course they take how often have i been thought a ribald and loser when i have guarded my words and looks and actions most carefully and now i will dare to do boldly what my heart tells me knowing that it is right yet poor thing she added after a moment thou art beggar enough i fear thou must husband thy little store well let me see i will count my treasure there are the fifty half nobles sent me by the king and those my dear protector gave me now for the little store of the poor old man and drawing a key from her bosom she crossed the room to where upon a window seat there stood a small oaken coffer containing her apparel and that of the poor old minstrel after opening the box and taking out one or two instruments of music which lay at the top she thrust her hand further down and brought forth a small leathern pouch fastened by a thong bound round it several times it cost her some trouble to unloose it but at length she spread out the mouth and poured the contents upon the top of the clothes in the coffer she had expected to see nothing but silver and copper but amongst the rest were several pieces of gold and besides these was a piece of parchment tied up with some writing upon it and a gold ring set with a large precious stone 
the former she examined closely and read the words with some difficulty for they were written by no very practised hand in rough and scattered characters she made it out at length however to be merely my ella's dowry and a tear fell upon it as she read she thought that the handwriting was her father's she then looked at the ring and saw by its lustre that it must be of some value but a strip of leather which was sewn round the gold caught her eye and she found it too traced with some rude characters they expressed a date however which was twenty first of july fourteen o three and what it meant she knew not opening the parchment packet she then proceeded to examine of what her little dowry consisted and to her surprise and joy she found forty broad pieces of gold nay she exclaimed this is indeed wealth why i am endowed like a knight's daughter and well might she say so for when we remember the difference between the value of gold in that day and at present the amount she now possessed what the sum she had just found and the penalty imposed by the king on simeon of roiden was equal to some six or seven hundred pounds i shall have enough to follow him for ten years said ella Brune, gazing on the gold without being a charge to any one and then there may still remain sufficient to gain me admission to a nunnery but i will lay it by carefully and placing all the gold she had except the few pieces that had been loose in the pouch into the parchment which had contained her dowry she tied it up again carefully and restored it to its place yet i will be avaricious she said i will disencumber myself of everything i do not want and change it into coin shall i sell this ring no it may mean something i do not know it is easily carried and might create suspicion if i disposed of it here perhaps my cousin at peronne can tell me more about it how shall i sell the other things nay i will ask the hostess to do it for me she will think of her own payment and will do it well after carefully putting back the ring and the money she opened the door of the room and called down the stairs hostess hostess mistress trenchard come in come in little maid said the good dame from below do not be in haste i am with you in a minute and after keeping ella waiting for a short time more to make herself of importance than because she had anything else to do she came panting up the stairs closed the door and seated herself on the side of the low bed well my poor ella she said what want you with me yours is a sad case indeed poor thing my husband and i both said when you and poor old murdoch brune went away to foreign lands leaving your own good country behind you that harm would come of it and yet he died in england replied ella with a sigh but what you say is very true hostess no good has come of it and we returned poorer than we went i have wherewithal to pay my score she added seeing a slight cloud come over the good mistress trenchard's face but yet i shall want more for my necessity and i would fain ask you a great favour what is that asked the hostess somewhat dryly it is simply that you would sell for me a good many of these things that i do not want answered ella here are several instruments of music which i know cost much and must produce something oh that i will right willingly replied the hostess and tis but right and fitting that you should trust such matters to one who is accustomed to buy and sell than to do it yourself who know nothing of trade god wot i will have them to westcheap where there are plenty of fripperies or carry them to the lombards who perhaps know more about such matters i should think that the lombards would purchase them best answered ella for one of these instruments the viol was purchased out of italy when my grandfather was chief minstrel to the great earl of northumberland ay i remember the time well said mistress Chenthard. murdoch brune was a great man in those days and rode upon a grey horse fit for a knight he used to pinch my cheek and call me pretty dolly trenchard till my husband was somewhat crusty and so the viol is valuable you think and the ribable too answered ella Brune, for they were cut by a great maker in italy and such are not to be found in england i will take care i will take care rejoined the hostess gather them all together and i will send up tom the drawer for them presently to-morrow i will take them to the lombards for it is somewhat late this evening nay but i have other favours to ask of you dame said ella Brune. 
"'Tomorrow they bury the poor old man, "'and I must have a black gown of serge and a white wimple, "'and I would fain that you went with me to the burial, "'if you could steal away for an hour, "'for it will be a sad day for me.' "'That will I do, poor maiden,' replied the hostess readily, "'not alone because she took a sincere interest in her fair guest, "'but because in those days, as in almost all others, "'people of inferior minds found a strange pleasure "'in bearing part of any impressive ceremony, however melancholy. "'As so much of her spare time was likely to be occupied on the morrow, "'she agreed to run up to Cheap that very night, "'before the watch was set, "'and to purchase for Ella Broom the mourning garments which she required.' The latter commission she performed fully to the girl's satisfaction, returning with a loose gown of fine black serge, ready-made, and a wimple and hood of clear lawn, little differing from that of a nun. Ella gazed on the dress with some emotion, murmuring to herself, "'Ay, the cloister, it must end there at last. Well, prayer and peace, tis the calmest fate after all.' but the sale of the instruments of music and several other small articles was not executed quite as well men were rogues in those times as at present though perhaps in the improvement of all things roguery has not been neglected and the good lombards took care not to give more than half the value of the goods they purchased neither ella nor good mistress trenchard herself knew any better however so that the latter thought she had made a very good bargain and the former was content her store was by this means considerably increased, and a short time before the appointed hour, Ella, with the hostess, set out towards the hospital of St. James, for the sad task that was to be performed that day. I will not pause upon the hours that followed. Dark and sorrowful such hours must ever be, for the dim eyes of mortality see the lamp of faith but faintly, and there is naught else to light our gaze through the obscure vault of death to the bright world of reunion put the holy promises to our heart as eagerly as fondly as we will how difficult it is to obtain a warm and living image of life beyond this life how the clay clings to the clay how the spirit cleaveth to the dust with which it hath borne companionship so long strange too to say that we can better realize in our own case the idea of renewed existence than in the case of those we love it is comparatively easy to fancy that we who have lived to-day shall live to-morrow that we who lie down to rest ourselves in sleep and to rise refreshed shall sleep in death and wake again renewed there is in every man's own heart a sentiment of his immortality which nothing can blot out but the vain pride of human intellect the bitterest ashes of the forbidden fruit but when we see the dearly loved the bright the beautiful the wise the good fall like a withered leaf into the dark corruption of the tomb the light go out like an extinguished lamp and all that is left all that has been familiar to our living senses drop into dust and mingle with its earth again the sadducean demon seizes on us and it requires a mighty struggle of the spirit prayer patience resignation hope and faith to win our belief from the dark actuality before us and fix it on the distant splendour of a promised world to come there were sad hours for poor ella Brune, and when they were over the chambers of the heart felt too dark and lonely for her to admit any thoughts but those of the dead she sent therefore to mary markham to tell her that she was too woebegone to come that day and returning to her little chamber at the inn she sat down to weep and pass the evening with her memories on the following morning early she once more set out for westminster and passed quietly along the road till she reached charing but near the hermitage and chapel of st catherine just opposite the cross she perceived a man standing gazing up the strand with the serpent embroidered on the black ground which distinguished the followers of sir simeon of roydon her fears might have betrayed her for she forgot for a moment the complete change of her dress and fancied that she must be instantly recognised but the instant after recovering her presence of mind she drew the hood far over her face and passed the man boldly without his even turning to look at her she then made her way on towards toad hill and soon came to the gates of the house in which sir philip beecham had taken up his temporary abode few but the higher nobility or persons immediately attached to the court 
indulged in those days in the luxury of a dwelling in london or the neighbouring city and when business or pleasure called inferior personages to the capital they either took up their dwelling at a hostel or found lodging in the mansions of some of the great families to whom they were attached by friendship or relationship nor was such hospitality ever refused so long as the house could contain more guests for each man's consequence and sometimes his safety depended upon the number of those whom he entertained and even when the lord was absent from his own dwelling the doors were always open to those who were known to be connected with him thus sir philip beecham had found ready lodging in the house of one of the numerous family of that name the head of which was then the earl of warwick though ere many years had passed an only daughter bore that glorious title into the house of neville when ella reached the mansion the porter distinguished by the cognizance of the bear was standing before the gates talking with a young man who seemed to have just dismounted from a tired horse and held the bridle rein cast over his arm in answer to ella's inquiry for the lady mary markham the old servant laughed saying here is another if it goes on thus all day there will be nothing else but the opening of gates for a pretty lady who is not here she departed last night with sir philip fair maid they went in great haste good sooth i know not why for twas but two hours before the sturdy old knight told me he should stay three days but they had letters by a messenger from the country so perchance his daughter is ill the blessed virgin give her deliverance said ella turning away with a disappointed look and bending her steps back towards the city of london she walked slowly on along the dusty road absorbed in no very cheerful thoughts and marking little of what passed around her but few people were yet abroad between the two towns the strand was almost solitary and she had nearly reached the wall of the garden of durham house which ran along to the temple when she heard a voice behind her exclaim in a sharp tone why do you follow her master knave what is that to you blue tabard replied another tongue i will let you know right soon if you do not desist answered the first whom do you serve asked the second the king was the reply so away with you ella looked round and beheld the man whom she had found speaking with the porter a moment before bending his brows sternly upon the servant of sir simeon of roydon whom she had seen watching near the hermitage of st catherine as she passed up the strand the latter however seemed to be animated by no very pugnacious spirit for he merely replied methinks one man has a right to walk the high road to london as well as another but he did not proceed to enforce this right by following the course he had been pursuing and crossing over from the south to the north side of the way he was soon lost among the low shops and small houses which there occupied the middle of the road i will ride along beside you fair maiden said ned dyram for he it was who had come up though i should not wonder from what the porter told me just now if you were the person i am looking for he spoke civilly and gravely and ella replied with a bright smile ha perhaps it is so for he said he would send whom do you come from i come from richard of woodville answered the man and i am sent to a maiden named ella brune living not far up the new street somewhat beyond the old temple in a hostelry called the falcon tis i tis i cried ella oh i am glad to see you her bright eyes lighted up and her fair face glowed with an expression of joy and satisfaction which added in no small degree to its loveliness for though we hear much of beauty in distress being heightened by tears yet there is an inherent harmony between man's heart and joy which makes the expression thereof always more pleasant to the eye than that of any other emotion ned dyram gazed at her with admiration but withdrew his eyes the moment after and resumed a more sober look i will give you all his messages by and by he said for i shall lodge at the falcon to-night and have much to say but yet i may as well tell you apart as we go along he continued dismounting from his horse and taking the bridle on his arm first fair maiden i was to ask how you fared and what you intended to do i have fared ill and well answered ella Broom, but that is a long story and i will relate it to you afterwards for that i can talk of though the people of the house should be present and what i am to do is a deeper question and i know not how to answer it i have friends at the court of burgundy 
"'What, then, are you of noble race, lady?' asked Ned Dyram in an altered tone. "'Oh, no,' replied Ella Broom, with a faint smile. "'The cousin of whom I speak is but a goldsmith to the Count of Charolois. "'But tis a long journey for a woman to take alone, through foreign lands, "'and amongst a people somewhat unruly. "'Why not come with us?' inquired Ned Dyram. "'We sail from Dover in three days, and our company will be your protection.' "'Did not child Richard tell you he was going?' "'Yes,' answered Ella Broom, casting down her eyes. "'But he did not seem to like the thought of having a woman in his company.' "'Faith, that is courteous of the good youth,' said Ned Dyram, with a low, sharp laugh. "'He may win his spurs, but will not merit them if he refuses protection to a lady.' "'That, I am sure, he would not do,' replied Ella gravely. "'He has given me the noblest protection at my need.' "'but he may not think it right.' "'No, no, you have mistaken him,' said Ned Dyram. "'He is courteous and kind, without a doubt. "'He might think it better for yourself to go to York, as he bade me tell you, "'and to see your friends there, and to claim your rights. "'But if you judge fit to turn your steps to Burgundy instead, "'depend upon it, he will freely give you aid and comfort on the way. "'If he did doubt,' added the man, "'twas but that he thought his lady-love might be jealous.' "'if she heard that he had so fair a maiden in his company, "'for you know he is a lover.' "'And he fixed his eyes inquiringly on Ella's face. "'I know he is,' she answered calmly and without a change of feature. "'I know the lady, too, but she is not unwilling that I should go, "'and I dread much to show myself in York.' "'Why so?' demanded Ned Dyram. "'But Ella Broom was not sufficiently won by his countenance or manner "'to grant him the same confidence.' "'that she had reposed in Richard of Woodville, and she replied, "'For many reasons, but the first and strongest is "'that there are persons there who have seized on that which should be mine. "'They are powerful, I am weak, and tis likely, as in such case often happens, "'that they will be willing to add wrong to wrong.' "'Not only often, but always,' replied Ned Dyram. "'Therefore I say, fair maiden, you had better come with us.' "'Here's one arm will strike a stroke for you, should need be, "'and there are plenty more amongst us who will do the like.' "'Ella answered him with a bright smile, "'but at that moment they were turning up the lane "'opposite the gate of the temple, "'and she paused in her reply, willing to think farther "'and see more of her companion before she decided. "'Stay, fair maiden,' continued Ned Dyram, "'who well knew where the hostelry of the falcon was situate.' "'It may be as well to keep our counsel, whatever it be, from host and hostess. "'Gossip is a part of their trade, and it is wise to avoid giving them occasion. "'I will give you, when we are within, a letter from my young lord, "'and read it to you, too, as perchance you cannot do that yourself. "'But it will let the people see that I am not without authority to hold converse with you, "'which may be needful.' "'Nay,' answered Ella, "'I can read it myself, for I have not been without such training.' "'Ay, I forgot,' rejoined Ned Dyram with one of his light sneers. "'Had you been a princess, you would not have been able to read. "'Such clerk-craft is only fit for citizens and monks. "'I wonder how Child Richard learned to read and write. "'I fear it will spoil him for a soldier.' "'The satire was not altogether just, "'for though it did not unfrequently happen "'that high nobles and celebrated warriors and statesmen "'were as illiterate as the merest boors, in some instances, especially after the Wars of the Roses, had deluged the land with blood, and interrupted all the peaceful arts of life, the barons affected to treat with sovereign contempt the cultivation of the mind. Yet such was not by any means so generally the case, as the pride of modern civilization had been eager to show. We have proofs incontestable that, in the reigns of Richard the Second, Henry the Fourth, and Henry the Fifth, men were by no means so generally ignorant as has been supposed the house of lancaster was proud of its patronage of literature and though more than one valiant noble could not sign his own name or could do so with difficulty there is much reason to believe that the exceptions have been pointed out as the rule for we know that many a citizen of london could not only maintain without the aid of another hand long and intricate correspondence with foreign merchants but also took delight in the reading, during winter's nights, of Chaucer and Gower, if not in studying secretly the writings of Wycliffe and his disciples. Ella Broom replied not, but walked on into the house, calling the good hostess, who, in that day as in others, 
often supplied the place of both master and mistress in a house of public entertainment. Ned Dyron followed her with his eyes into the house, scrutinizing with keen and wondering glance the beauties of form which even the long loose robe of serge could not fully conceal. He marvelled at the grace he beheld, even more rare at that day amongst the sons and daughters of toil than at present and although the pride of rank and station could not in his case suggest the bold disregard of all law and decency in seeking the gratification of passion his feelings towards ella brune were not very far different from those of sir simeon of roydon he might have more respect for the opinion of the world by which he hoped to rise he might even have more respect for and more belief in virtue for he was a wiser man he might seek to obtain his ends by other means he was even not incapable of love strong passionate overpowering love but the moving power was the same it was all animal for strange to say though his intellect was far superior to that of most men of his day though he had far more mind than was needful or even advantageous in his commerce with the world of that age his impulses were all animal towards others that which he cared for little in himself he admired he almost worshipped in woman it was beauty of form and feature only that attracted him mind he cared not for he thought not of nay up to that moment he perhaps either doubted whether it existed in the other sex or thought it a disadvantage if it did even more the heart itself he valued little or rather that strange and complex tissue of emotions springing from what source we know not entwined with our mortal nature by what delicate threads who can say which we are accustomed to ascribe to the heart he regarded but as an almost worthless adjunct his was the eager love forgive me if i profane what should be a holy name rather than use a coarser term of the wild beast the appetite of the tiger only tempered by the shrewdness of the fox i mean not to say it always remains so for under the power of passion and circumstances the human heart is tutored as a child neither would i say that aught like love had yet touched his bosom for ella brune but i speak of his ordinary feelings towards woman but feelings of that sort are sooner roused than those of a higher nature he saw that she was very beautiful more beautiful he thought than any woman of his own station that ever he had beheld and that was enough to make him determine upon counteracting his master's wishes and counsel and persuading ella to turn her steps in the same course in which his own were directed he knew not how willing she was to be persuaded he knew not that she was at heart already resolved but he managed skilfully he watched shrewdly through the whole of his after communications with her during the day he discovered much he discovered all indeed but one deep secret which might have been penetrated by a woman's eyes but which was hid from his with all their keenness the motive the feeling that led her so strongly in the very path he wished he saw indeed that she was so inclined he saw that there was a voice always seconding him in her heart and he took especial care to furnish that voice with arguments which seemed irresistible he contrived too to win upon her much for there was in his conversation that mingling of frankness and flattering courtesy of apparent carelessness of pleasing with all the arts of giving pleasure and that range of desultory knowledge and tone of superior mind with apparent simplicity of manner and contempt for assumption which of all things are the most calculated to dazzle and impress for a time tis the lighter qualities that catch the deeper ones that bind and though had there been a comparison drawn between him who was her companion for a great part of that evening and richard of woodville ella brune would have laughed in scorn yet she listened well pleased to the varied conversation with which he whiled away the hours when she could wean her thoughts from dearer though more painful themes yielded to his arguments when they seconded the purposes of her own heart and readily accepted his offered service to aid her in executing the plan she adopted End of chapter seventeen